It's, it's a huge honor to be here talking uh, to all of you, uh, both in person and virtually, on, uh, on really on any topic here. But today we're going to be talking about lung transplantation, um, which, uh, which includes several of our services together, and I'll point out various aspects of that. It's amazing to be together, finally in person a little bit, um, after this terrible COVID pandemic. Um, my disclosures are shown here. Uh, uh, the College of Baylor College of Medicine receives grant support for involvement in several clinical trials, as mentioned here. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is on this concept of risks, of how we take risks, why we take them, when we take them, and, and then how we take them. Um, so that'll be kind of a theme throughout the case. As, I'm sure everybody recognizes this individual here, Dr. Denton Cooley, um, who established the Texas Heart Institute um, with many additional individuals. So he was actually credited with the first heart-lung transplant in 1967, um, and, and that was for a, a young pediatric patient who needed a heart transplant, but her lungs um, had also failed from pneumonia. So back then you could actually kind of take whatever organ you needed. And so he asked to also get the lungs as well. Successfully put it in, patient survived for a few days, but then afterwards unfortunately succumbed to infections. Um, before that, a uh, single lung transplant had been done in the early 1960s, also survived only a couple of days. Um, and it really wasn't until about 1980s uh, that the first reported survivor beyond one year um, happened. And so I, I say that only to mention that there's a, there is already a, a pretty baseline high level of risk involved in this procedure to begin with. Um, and then on top of that, now we're stretching the envelope even significantly more on top of that baseline risk. Um, if you fast forward to where we're at today, we're in a program that functions at 98% 90-day survival, which if you think about um, you know, aortic valves, coronary bypass, they track us out to 30 days. Um, and this is 90-day this is data. If we look at our data, we're following our data up to one year and even three years. And at one year, we maintain ourselves above 90 and 95%. Um, so it's a super high scrutiny. Um, and, and it's important to be able to, to recognize that as we think about what we're doing to, for our recipients and, and to help maximize donor organs. So our transplant program here at Baylor St. Luke's is essentially really has taken off substantially. Um, over the last uh, two years, we've collectively done nearly 200 transplants, including this year. And that puts us up at the top five uh, transplant programs in the nation, and it's including Cleveland Clinic, um, Duke, um, and several other programs. And our goal is to, to maintain and to sustain and to continue uh, pushing there. It's no, no, certainly no easy feat, and it takes a, a village. So if we're going to be pushing the envelope beyond there, I think uh, you know, a couple of things that, that always resonate with me is just maintaining uh, some humility to understand what the baseline risks are uh, and, to try, and to try to listen constantly to see how you can safely increase that. And then, of course, you have to have a little bit of courage to move forward. Uh, there's just no other way to do that. I mean, we wouldn't have transplantation today. We wouldn't have LVAS. We wouldn't have a lot of what we have today without a little bit of courage, which is, is critical. Um, Yusta Pedersen is, is, you know, probably after Denton Cooley is probably one of the, the best cardiac surgeons that walked the face of the planet. He, and I had the privilege of training under him when I was in Cleveland. He always would mention that danger is always closer than you think. And the more you respect that, uh, the more you can, you can take on higher and higher risks. So in transplant, obviously we, can, we have a lot of options. We can do single lung transplants, doubles, heart lung blocks, or low bar transplants. Just gonna walk you briefly through the basics of the procedure. The, the donor procurement occurs along Sondergaard's groove. We pre usually protect the heart if we're gonna use the heart for transplant, uh, but we remove the heart uh, and we're left with this block here. So we have an open left atrial cuff uh, that we use. Um, and we have an open uh, pulmonary artery, and, and then we have an open trachea that we sew. We split this down the middle, and we sew each side in individually. Um, so that allows us to use the other organ to be ventilating while we're working on one side in a so-called off-pump fashion, or we can just go on full cardiopulmonary bypass and put it on as one block. 
And so a lot of uh, all of the surgeons that work with me and our team, myself included, we do a lot of coronary revascularization work. Um, and so it, we can also actually bring the mammary artery down and, and anastomose that to the bronchial arteries and actually supply blood flow to the bronchial arteries as well um, to increase. And there's there are very few centers doing that right now. We're trying to modify that technique to make it a little bit more broadly user friendly. Um, our exposures can be very variable. We can either do small incisions underneath the breastbone on both sides or on a single side if it's a single, or we can go across the sternum if it's a clamshell. We can also go up and down for a sternotomy, and it really depends on the patient's anatomy. Much like uh, at least my cardiac practice, and I know many of my partners um, that do minimally invasive cardiac surgery, it's a lot about the imaging. So we look at the imaging to try to plan where that incision is going to go, um, whether it's going to be upper, medi upper median stenotomy, right lateral thoracotomy, and it's no different for lung transplant where we try to plan the incision and tailor it to the patient. And uh, we've published on this and have shown very good results taking this approach. Once we're in there and looking at the hilum, there's the airway, uh, which we sew. We run the posterior layer of it. Um, and then the anterior layer, we tend to do it in interrupted sutures. And we found that this leads to the best uh, long-term outcomes for the graft when we do it like this. Um, it's even better if we revascularize the bronchial artery, but there's only special, uh, unique situations where that occurs. Um, here, the pulmonary artery, we see uh, us, we have a clamp on it, and we're sewing the interior wall of it, and then finally, the left atrium. This is a, a little bit of a dicey part of the procedure in general, especially if we're off pump, if we're without the cardiopulmonary bypass support, because you're really sewing directly into the heart, um, and it really just takes uh, a fraction of a second to lose about a liter and a half of blood in, in, before you know it. Um, so uh, thank God, you know, actually that, you know, things like that, you know, never really have happened here, which is amazing um, in over 500 transplants at least. But it's something that's constantly on our mind. Again, danger is always closer than we think. Um, so what, who are the patients that we're taking care of? Um, there's a broad category of patients that qualify for lung transplants, huge amount of diagnoses. Many of these patients have concomitant coronary disease, so we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, but we have our COPDers, bronchiectatic disease, pulmonary vascular disease, restrictive lung disease, um, retransplants, obviously our COVID population now, and just many, many different diagnoses. Um, this is a, a study that was done by Elizabeth Godfrey, one of our medical students here, who's now a surgical resident at Stanford, and looked at your diagnosis from the time of listing and what your long-term outcomes are. Found that uh, for cystic fibrosis patients, they tend to have the greatest long-term outcome. Um, they, they also tend to be a little bit younger, so it's no surprise. Uh, and other diagnoses also have very good outcomes. Our obstructive lung disease and restrictive lung disease have a lot of comorbidities, so they tend to be the ones that sag a little bit behind long term. But what's fascinating is that if you have a lot of positive factors to the patient, so they're in better shape, um, they're listed earlier, uh, they, they tend to actually survive longer, especially conditional on that first year. And for lung transplant, that's very important because it still lags behind heart transplant in terms of long-term outcomes. So it's actually striking to see anything that causes a major improvement in that long-term survival. Uh, but improving our long-term outcomes is still a subject of intense research. So it's super rewarding to see the patients that we've transplanted um, over the years. Um, and many of the people on this slide were turned down by centers for a multitude of reasons. So this gentleman was a first COVID transplant. It's unclear whether we should be transplanting patients for COVID. He's now three years out and doing great, celebrates his lung anniversary every year. <laughs> this gal had severe multidrug resistant uh, organisms, really didn't have medicines to treat her. We, we ended up removing her lungs in block, irrigating copiously with antibiotic irrigation etc. Um, clearing her sepsis, transplanting her, and now she's skydiving every year as in celebration of her lung anniversary. This gentleman had severe multivessel coronary disease, um, wouldn't transplant him. We did a single lung transplant with PCI as a bridged approach, and he's been doing great. This gal was a redo transplant turned down by the Mayo Clinic and sent to us. She had pectus excavatum, and we were able to do her case and plan it carefully. And, and, and the list goes on and on. This gentleman here was in, uh, to the far corner on the left, the Navy SEAL, um, who was 75 years old, and nobody would give him a chance. They said, you know, you're, you're 75, so 
but we we saw him and we're like okay yeah he's 75 but he's still climbing like mountains and stuff with oxygen so he's probably going to do okay and he and he's thank god he's done actually quite well so how did i get into this field well, number one, uh, it, 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 there was no question that I wasn't sure I was going to be doing lung transplant. Right now, I'm very super passionate about it. But when I went to train at the Cleveland Clinic, which is um, a really very high volume cardiac center, uh, one of the things that I realized, a lot of my mentors, they would pair you up with a mentor um, and you would work with them for three months. And so I was paired up with Ken McCurry and with Yosta Pedersen. These guys are doing about 300 hearts a, a day, 300 hearts a year. Um, but they're doing all the lung transplants. So all of their kind of top tier cardiac surgeons were doing the lung transplants, which was very appealing to me. And you had to choose uh, one of three or four different specialties, aortic or transplant or, um, or minimally invasive. And what I, you know, I just felt like this, taking care of this very end stage population of patients really gave you this full spectrum of the worst. And then you can also kind of handle some of the not so worst. So it, it's made for a really nice, uh, pretty well-rounded practice in my, in my experience ever since then. And, and there's no question that it is a specialty that there's a lot of questions to be answered um, related to improving longevity and improving up, upfront outcomes. So it's been really just an amazing voyage, but it's been that mentorship that really got me started on this, on this path. And, um, and I wouldn't be here you know, without that mentorship. So there are several you know, uh, complex scenarios that I wanted to just discuss briefly. Um, that, that build upon the average scenario, which is just somebody with end-stage lung disease and you do their transplant and you expect them to do well. Uh, but there's a lot of very complicated scenarios that, that go on top of that. One is the concomitant cardiac surgical procedures. Up to 20% of our patients have some degree of coronary disease or either valve or disease, coronary disease, PFOs, tricuspid valve, aortic valve, you name it. Um, so concomitant cardiac surgical procedures is a reality that we have to think about as we're doing transplants, whether it's coronary artery disease and doing cabbages or doing AVR, MVR, TVRs, et cetera. Um, I've done aneurysm repairs in the setting of, uh, of double lung transplants, descending aneurysm repair, bypass repairs, ascending aneurysm repairs, aortic valve repair, replacement, maze, left atrial appendage, you name it. Um, we've done, and over the course of the time that I've been doing this, over 10 years, this has shifted dramatically because of two main things that I'll point out. One is a little more recognition of the impact of the cardiopulmonary bypass uh, and stuff on the lung graft, that's one thing, and the explosion in endovascular um, cardiac interventions, coronary and TAVR and PFO closures. So both of those have, as you can just imagine, has merged into this plane where we, we try to limit what we do. And that's how we get a lot of these patients through, is we try to, to limit the stress, limit the stress in the transplant itself and stage a lot of the procedures, whether we do them endovascularly or we do them before or we do them afterwards. And, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean about that in a second. When we have done, early in our experience, we did do a lot of concomitant cardiac surgery at the same time as, as lung transplant. This is one nice series that kind of showed what the, what the landscape of that would look like. Mostly it's PFOs, so ASDs or PFOs that stayed open because of severe pulmonary hypertension, or tricuspid valve disease, which makes sense, um, and a lot of cabbages. And, and as I mentioned, in, in our experience, we've also had a, a fair share of aortic valves and even mitrals. When we look at concomitant cardiac surgery, um, the, obviously you have longer bypass times, about 193 minutes compared to 148. Overall, uh, survival estimates are pretty similar though, so that's encouraging. That tells us that we don't have to turn someone down just because they have, they have concomitant cardiac disease. We can do it. Um, but when you look at the morbidity associated with the operation, they definitely have greater re-exploration for bleed. They have almost double the time on the ventilator. Um, they are more likely to, um, to be in the hospital for longer lengths of stay. Uh, but overall, the 30-day mortality and long-term mortality is actually pretty good. So how about coronary revascularization? This is by far the most common scenario that we see. The options are cabbage or PCI for, for these patients. All of our patients get cath before um, they go for transplant. Um, so 
if you look at this slide here, uh, this is data from the Duke group that was uh, published in 2013, uh, but it's the largest series looking at this. The, the pre-op uh, PCIs here in the dashed line looks like it actually gives a bit of a survival advantage compared to doing um, cabbage at the same time of, as the transplant. Um, and this is particularly true if you take into account age. So if the recipient is older than 65, probably more frail, other comorbidities, then doing all of that, three vessel bypass, bilateral lung transplant, all of that at the same time, is a lot of swelling for the graft, a lot more end organ dysfunction. So to me, it's no surprise that the outcomes are a bit worse in that scenario and PCI wins out. Um, when you look at patients who have concomitant cabbage versus pre-op PCI, concomitant cabbage uh, is associated with greater incidence of surgical feeding tubes, greater incidence of, of tracheostomy compared to patients who were staged with PCI. Um, Post-operative length of stay is longer with concomitant cabbage. Uh, as well as post-op intensive care units. So the moral of the story with cabbage is that you do it only if you really need to. Um, and then even then, if you really need to, we try to plan off-pump approaches for it or maybe doing it on ECMO, try to minimize the stress as much as we can. So you're not doing a full-out assault of, of bilateral lungs, full bypass, three difficult you know, targets or four difficult targets. So we really try to stage it. The challenge becomes patients who are really sick, right? They come in and they can't wait um, to be listed. But more often than not, we can bridge them. And we bridge them with PCI, either um, a non-drug eluding stent, but even drug eluding stents, um, you can actually get away with. We've transplanted many people after just 30 days of a drug eluding stent. They haven't had MIs um, afterwards. So, it, it's been, obviously, this field has been a revolution thanks to our, our incredible cardiology colleagues. How about PFOs? We, we see PFOs a lot. As you can ima imagine, PFO totally changes the operation. If you're, if you're going to repair a PFO in the setting of a lung transplant, you need to go you know, on pump. You need to probably clamp the heart if you can, if you want to be safe um, to prevent any air embolism, and you, and you want to work inside the chamber and repair the PFO. It's a simple procedure, but it, it is going to increase the amount of support being used at the time of the lung transplant. It's going to change the dynamics of the transplant. And interestingly, the tricuspid valve repair group actually did quite well. Um, less time on the ventilator, less graft dysfunction, better long-term lung function. So that tells us that if we're going in there for severe pulmonary hypertension and they have severe tricuspid regurg, we just fix it. Um, and it's okay, and it's, and it's just quite frankly part of the deal, uh, but the, the outcomes turned out to be very good. People with severe pulmonary hypertension are more than often having the procedure done on pump anyways. And so it doesn't add a whole lot to that procedure. Reoperations after prior cardiac surgery has become increasingly common for us. In 2016, one of my colleagues published a real nice article looking at the UNOS data on this. Um, the, these are patients who've had grafts before mammaries, maybe Lima, maybe Rima, maybe multiple vein grafts. Um, and sure enough, cabbage was one of the biggest factors in in uh, morbidity and mortality after the lung transplant, worse one-year survival if the patient had a cabbage prior to the lung transplant. Um, but what was interesting is if you look at the procedure that was chosen by the surgeon, so if they chose to do a bilateral lung transplant, which is what, what I used to do, what a lot of us used to do early in, in the experience was we would just go through, redo sternotomy, redo bilateral lung, um, tease out the mammary, protect the mammary, protect all the grafts, go on pump and do the bilateral lung transplant. Those have the worst outcomes. So that's a lot of work, a lot of pump time and stuff like this have the worst outcomes. If you go in and sneak in from the right side, avoid the lima completely and just do a single lung and maybe even come back later and do a single left if you need to, you have no pump time, you have much less bleeding, and by and large, those patients do really well. And, and that's how our practice is, has changed because even though we're trying to get the, the benefit of a bilateral lung, you can't really get that benefit if you have a lot of upfront morbidity. Um, how about reoperative lung transplant? It's becoming more and more common. Um, we're seeing our numbers of reoperative cases going like skyrocketing right now for centers from all around the country are sending us their reops, or second time, third time reops. Um, we, what, 
what you know is that the reop patients do worse than, than the primary time around. But the greatest risk is in that first year. If we get them through that first year, their outcomes are almost equivalent to when they had their first transplant. So a lot has gone around trying to figure out how to make that first year safer. And a lot of that has to do with the way the surgery is conducted. Um, this is a study by a close collaborator of ours uh, from Hanover Medical School. Um, and they popularized the protocol a long time ago, which we started adopting, a few other programs have started adopting, and again, is completely different than the way I was doing redo transplants like eight years ago. Um, eight years ago, it was, again, you know, full part cardiopulmonary bypass support, being very worried about getting into bleeding, things like that, and doing, doing the whole transplant with, with a full onslaught support. Instead, now we, we try to do actually minimal, minimally invasive incisions. We try to stay working on the quadrant that we're working on. So if we're doing the right side first, we stay on the right side. We get a really good right-sided lung graft. We very carefully tease everything off, off pump. We may have wires in. Um, we clamp, we do the procedure off pump, we sew the right graft in, and we use that right graft to then support us to do the same thing on the other side. It does take some time, um, so it's, it's kind of funny. They have this coffee break that they advocate, and we've been doing this as well. So a lot of times after the first one's in, we go and we get a coffee break because it's true. You're starting a whole new surgery again on the other side. Um, but if you lose that patience, then you run into trouble and, and the outcomes are worse. This by far has changed our outcomes when it comes to reoperative transplant. We're barely giving transfusions. Um, we're using a lot more sternal sparing procedures. Uh, much less bypass, occasionally ECMO if we need to. Survivals is much better in the first year, first two years. Less dialysis rate, less tracheostomy rates, um, and less 30-day um, and hospital mortality. Primary graft dysfunction is the real competing risk that we have um, with these. So we need to limit when we're do if we're doing a cabbage in a lung, if we're doing a valve in a lung, or if we're doing a kidney in a lung, whatever we're doing, we, we can get away with it technically, but we have to realize that the graft, if the graft develops graft dysfunction, that's gonna derail a lot of the post-operative things. So you'll have you know, beautiful bypass grafts, but the lungs aren't working and they won't start working for a while. So it's, it's a real competing threat to us in every lung transplant, but especially in combined procedures. Um, it turns out, as I've alluded to so far, cardiopulmonary bypass is one possible modifiable factor that can contribute to that edema in the lung. Um, and we've been looking at that here with our research groups uh, at the Texas Heart Institute. Um, and it turns out that, in fact, the cardiopulmonary bypass and ECMO groups do have greater inflammatory markers. Um, they have greater B cell act activity, so they have a lot more inflammation. You look at the endothelial cells, even so in an off-pump approach, they look really nice, uh, but they start to get scattered and disrupted at, with ECMO, and, and they kind of get pretty sheared up with bypass. So it's, it's really kind of fascinating the way the inflammatory response can affect this. We looked at over 850 patients and found the same thing in a multi-center trial, um, that bypass had the greatest graft dysfunction, ECMO was in the middle, and off-pump was the lowest. Now, you can't do every case off-pump, it's, it's impossible. Only 50% of the cases you can do off-pump. Um, so our go-to now has become ECMO. So if we need any additional support, we go with that. It's also important when we're thinking about high-risk scenarios is being careful about the type of donor that you use. So if we get risky on the recipient and get risky on the donor, that can be a bad combination. Um, you, you start to stack up a lot of risk factors. Uh, and if we look here, these are high risk to high risk combinations. They had the worst one year survival compared to um, perhaps lower risk recipients that had more extended criteria donors. Unfortunately though, there is a critical organ shortage. We can't always be choosy about what we're gonna get. 15 to 30 percent of patients are dying on the wait list, and so this is a, a constant balance that we have to achieve. 80 percent of donor organs are lost uh, and are not even utilized. So we, and also the decision to accept a donor is a very emotional one. Sometimes you're, you know, it's a risky situation. Two o'clock in the morning, if somebody called you and, and, and gave you a um, a stock proposal or an investment opportunity in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, 
you're going to be a little bit gun shy about accepting that. Whereas if it was during the day and, and you had all the information laid out in front of you, you might look at it differently. Um, so we've taken a lot of interest in that, in the emotional aspect of, of taking higher risk donors. Um, we built a consensus scoring system to try to see what the highest volume transplant surgeons around the world accept. Um, and we actually developed it into an iPhone app. Um, so when it's the middle of the night, we have number one, an independent screening service that objectively gives us a sense of whether this is an organ that is, is quite good or not. So it's, we don't have to rely on our own biases. And we have a score that is calculated. So we get, we get a lot of information that makes it much easier for me to make a high risk decision at any time of the day, whether it's at night or in the morning. We've, We've looked at a lot of things. I think that there's a lot of emphasis placed on the donor that sometimes is a little bit not based on science. So the most common question we get is how old is my donor? How old is the donor? How old is the donor? It's the most common question. So of course we had to look at this and we did not find an effect with donor age on survival after bilateral lung transplants. Now we know from the ISHLT data that when you get up in excess of 65 to 70 years, it does affect long longevity. Um, but for the most part, you can stay anywhere from 13 to 65 and you can function in a pretty wide spectrum without a lot of difference in your outcomes. We use a lot of uh, innovation to try to increase our donor organ pool. This is a device that allows us to transport the organ from point A to point B and allows us to monitor it to give us a second check of how well it's working. We have our amazing perfusionists here in the group that help lead this program for us around the clock. Um, this shows the portability of the chamber. We've published using this very extended criteria donors with greater than 90% survival, which was uh, significantly better than the national average. So that helps us to do more. We also do reoperative donor harvest. So pa this patient had bilateral mammary arteries in the donor hospital. We had to take the organs from that patient who expired, was relatively young with young coronary vascular disease. The lungs were in good shape, um, so we did take them, but it, it is in the middle of nowhere. You don't have pump standby, so you have to, it's a, it's a much more tricky operation, but we're, we're very privileged that we have, that all of our surgeons are able to do this, and we're able to offer that much more to our donor pool. So a couple of uh, interesting cases here, if we have a little time. So this is a 51-year-old gentleman who had pulmonary hypertension, was on sildenafil, bosentin, and also CKD3. And he was transferred to us with dyspnea. He actually ended up having a pericardial effusion as well. He got a pericardial window. Um, it was going to get a pericardial window, but he had RV dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, AFib. So he was initially admitted for heart failure tuna, pulmonary hypertension management, he started on BiPAP as diureced, um, and then started escalating the pulmonary vasodilators in order to wean the pressors. Um, but unfortunately, uh, seven days into his hospital course, he had a PEA arrest with torsad. Um, the chest compressors were, were done after several rounds of him being intubated. He did have ROSC and return of spontaneous contraction. Um, you can see his total billy rose up to 3.9, AST and ALT elevated, creatinine went up, lactate went up greater than 13, did not look very promising. And this is kind of when we met him for a transplant evaluation. So we were like, uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing that we're going to be able to offer. But, you know, I can tell you that working here is one of the things I just love working in this, it, it, with this group, with these individuals at the Texas Heart and Baylor. Nothing's off the table. Um, these guys <laughs> brought them back to the cath lab, um, and put in an Avalon. Um, they, uh, our, our cardiology team did a transeptal puncture, um, brought a lot of his pressures down, improved his hemodynamics, improved his total bilirubin, his lactate, creatinine started improving. His x-ray cleared up and the, the ECMO was decannulated and, and he actually did quite well. He was discharged home 20 days later. Totally floored me when they asked me to come back and, and look at him again. <laughs> so um, he was doing uh, physical therapy, his cardiac function improved. Heart. Um, he did continue to come in with heart failure admission. So this is one of these guys where if the RV, we expect the RV to be a little down in pulmonary hypertension, this is gonna happen. But if the RV is less than 30% ejection fraction by MRI, we think they probably are gonna do better with a heart lung. Because if not, they're hobbling along with two lungs and, and they're getting, and you're just flooring them, trying to put them on max dose of epinephrine and dobutamine, it's better to just go to a heart lung in those scenarios. 
Also, adult congenital heart disease, we do, a lot of, we do heart lungs for those, or patients with severe uh, cardiac disease at the time of lung transplant, we would prefer to do heart lung. Um, so the patient was doing well, came back two months later, had a heart lung transplant. Um, he had a little bit of a, a complex force, but nothing too bad that we would expect. He was here for about 60 days, mostly because of effusions, recurrent effusions. We did trach him out of, for, out of really precaution, um, and he's still to this day home doing very well uh, after this procedure. So we've been very happy with him. I love heart lung transplant. I think it's a, if, it, if and the allocation's a little bit better for it, so we're able to get more of the heart organs. Otherwise, we used to wait on the wait list too long. It's prohibitive. Um, but now it's a little bit easier to get a, a heart graft, so uh, it's a very nice operation to do. Um, now. If we're flying like, you know, so close to the sun here, uh, you know, you're going to get burned. You're going to get burned on cases, there's no question, and, and you're going to get burnt out uh, as an individual practitioner. Your team is going to get burnt out, <laughs> and your hospital is going to get burnt out, and especially nowadays with COVID. So, you know, while, while it's helpful and important to talk about the technical aspects of what we do and, and how critical that is, I think that, that there's also almost like 40 to 50% of what we do is very mental and is very team oriented and trying to, to develop an elite team around this because um, none of those cases, you know, it was, it was me alone and half of those cases is my partner doing them or it's just a huge village teeing up the case so that I can just do the case. Um, but this, you, you can't push the envelope without having an elite team like we do here. Um, and, and there are many attributes to an elite team, but one of them is comfort zone ex expansion. And that's taking risk, the willingness to take a little bit of risk, and, but understanding the value of that within your organization, what that means and how you can handle it and how you can do it. It's something we're constantly thinking about, constantly pushing ourselves to do. Trust is also a huge factor. So when you're dealing with super high risk cases, right now I have, you know, I have a patient who's getting dealt with in the cath lab and you have to have 100% trust in your team because they you have to trust them to do it because there's just too many factors going on in this enormous tree you know enormous organization um, for you to, to micromanage every aspect of you completely burn out um, doing it um, so we're very mission oriented in what we're doing um, we have a there's a huge team involved in these transplants and high risk or even the standard one our surgeons or pulmonologists our cardiologists administrators ancillary team members physician extenders, researchers, our intraoperative teams is enormous, our perfusionists, anesthesia surgeons, residents, scrub techs. Um, our, our donor procurement teams is a whole other you know, aspect of things. They're going all around the country. They're going to Puerto Rico, they're going to Alaska, we're going to Hawaii. Um, so it's an, an enormous group. Um, do you need, you need me to get off? Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry, I thought it was like it. No, no problem. So, I also think that, that uh, taking some time for yourself is also super critical when you're doing these kind of cases and these kind of scenarios. Because uh, one thing that I've learned, aside from all the stuff with the pump and the inflammatory markers and this, that, and the other, is that if I'm refreshed, uh, you're gonna do a, a really complicated, very high-risk procedure, a lot smoother than when you're burnt out and just like really kind of stressed because of all the stuff that's going on. And, um, and, and as a team, we work a lot on, on that with our partners and we try to have enough people doing these cases, enough people around us. So, you know, this is my family. I've just, I've seen probably more, as many soccer games as I've seen uh, lung transplants. And, and now this kid, you know, he was playing soccer we were, when I was at the Cleveland Clinic and now he's like, you know, playing for NCAA team. My daughter is now graduating. I've, I've been thankful to catch all these major events. I used to play a lot of music. I played in a band when I, before I, I got into medical school. So, you know, I, I really try to focus on playing as much music as I can. Um, my son and I got into uh, martial arts and, and kickboxing, so we, so we do it. Now, unfortunately, he's gone, so people just beat me up. <laughs> and uh, so now I'll go to another scenario. So this is a 36-year-old African-American male. I'll leave you with this one and one more. Um, worsening shortness of breath at an outside hospital was worked up for a lung transplant for severe ILD. It was kind of interesting. He was huge. I mean, he had a huge BMI, uh, which really just kind of takes him off the table in most cases. 
Um, but he's young and, and he's, he's just at end stage. He also had secondary pulmonary hypertension. Unfortunately, all the risk factors for primary graft dysfunction after a transplant. Um, he was pretty comfortable when he got to us. His echo showed preserved uh, RV function, but he was on high flow, nasal cannula. Um, he could barely talk. Um, his RV seemed okay though, and, and his LV function was a little bit depressed. We started his workup up immediately the minute he hit the door. Um, but there was just like a minute or two switch in his nitric oxide and he crashed and he just completely crashed. And the hypoxic cardiac arrest, cardiology team rescued him at the bedside, put him on peripheral VA ECMO, I think it was maybe the fellow that did it and it got him back. Um, and we then switched him from VA ECMO to VV ECMO so that we could ambulate him, move him around a little bit more. Um, and then, but then on VV ECMO's RV started to fail again. So then we, we knew we needed to get more of a VA arrangement. You know, at this point, we're getting deeper and deeper into a high risk situation. So we're, we don't feel very comfortable here. We're kind of up against the ropes. We, you got a, a huge BMI. Um, you, you got somebody who's totally end stage. They're getting worse. You know, how is this worth it? You know, um, but you know, we, we just kept saying, let's just see where we can get him. You know, let's see how he can do with a little bit of rehabilitation. So um, uh, my, my partner actually, so Dr. Shafi does a lot with portable ECMO, very interesting portable ECMO scenarios. So advised us to do this one where we sewed a graft into the right axillary. Through the graft, we put a cannula into the ascending aorta. So that basically gives us central cannulation without opening the chest. Um, and then we put a multi-stage venous cannula through the right uh, IJ. So this is off-label. This is not, I hope our perfusionists aren't listening to this. <laughs> and, uh, but, but we're using a 29 multi, 29, 29, 29 cannula just through the neck. Uh, and so you're cannulating almost like you're central without opening the chest. Um, so we did that arrangement for him. You can see the cannulas here. Um, and amazingly, he was extubated with that, did not need a tracheostomy. He started weight bearing, started interacting. Um, he was using the bike, his hemodynamic stabilized. And so we said, okay, so he may be good to go. We reactivated him on the list. We did his, after 28 days of ECMO support, and by the way, at this point, we're transplanting people with nine months of ECMO support. So the, the, the time on ECMO support it doesn't matter so much anymore. Um, but we did his case on full cardiopulmonary bypass, median sternotomy, bilateral lung transplant, um, and, and he did great. And he's, he's actually continuing to do well. Uh, it was discharged home. One last case was one of our partners here called me to, uh, to the room. <laughs> he, had just, he had just done a, a complex aortic root replacement on a patient who had some baseline ILD who came in in shock and, um, and, and was not doing very well. He said, you know, now he's on VV ECMO. Can you go and take a look and see if he would be a candidate? So I'm like, okay, he just had a root. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's uh, no way. You know, it's, uh, but we went over, we saw him, uh, we switched his ECMO arrangement around to more ambulatory. We put him on this Abiumed Breathe system, which, which right now is one of the parts is getting recalled, um, but we're looking forward to getting it back here in September. Um, but this, is, this was devised by Bart Griffith, so it's, it's from, the, um, from the Maryland group. Uh, and, but it's, we're, one of, we're, we're the first center in Texas to use it. It's one of few centers in the, in the country. Super ambulatory. It's intended to be a briefcase that the patient can ultimately go home with. Um, so we, we utilized this form. We were able to get him moving around, ambulating, getting stronger. He got well beyond his, his initial root replacement. About three months afterwards, he got strong enough to get a single lung transplant. Um, he did actually, he, he surprised everybody was discharged in about two and a half weeks uh, to rehab after his surgery, so he did really well. This is the breathe system. This was his x-ray beforehand, uh, and this is his x-ray with a single right lung transplant after that. So in conclusion, uh, combined procedures, high-risk lung transplants are definitely feasible um, with acceptable or comparable outcomes. Recipient selection certainly is important. Procedural selection, minimizing your support stress if you can, understanding your extracorporeal life support options is very important. Obviously maintaining uh, elite mission-centered teams and maintaining balance so you can do these cases is very important. So with that, I want to thank absolutely everybody in this room. Everybody's been involved in this, and everybody who's probably watching has also been involved in this. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, I mean, every day I'm just grateful to be here. So thanks for all your support.